Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 9th. Today, we celebrate the man who named the lipstick tree and was known as Florida's Burbank. We'll also learn about the incredible work of an extraordinary Russian botanist who was tragically sentenced to death on this day in 1941. And today we honor the life of the father of hybrid corn. And today's poetry is all about a favorite summer crop, tomatoes. We grow that garden library with a witty and poetic book about gardening and life. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a Marvel character near and dear to gardeners' hearts. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world in today's curated news. First up is an email from Deb M., who shared a picture of her very first trumpet bloom of the year. Do 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 do. Yep, it looks fantastic. Then Susan A. wrote in to share a picture of a rose. And she writes, I call this my lucky rose. My friend had pruned her old rose severely back, and I brought some of the cuttings back to my garden and stuck them in the ground. This one took. Lucky rose indeed. Then Pete K. wrote in to ask, do you name your gardens? That's a good question. You know, Pete, I used to name my gardens. And now if I name them, I just use the direction they are on the property. So I'll say this is the eastern garden. This is the western garden. But I used to name them after the last names of some of my ancestors. But the longer I garden, and probably the more I podcast, I have less time for that. And so I just stick with directions. But I know lots of gardeners who come up with all kinds of clever names for their gardens. And, you know, come to think about it, we did name our cabin. We call it Ashton House because it's on this little lake called Ashton Lake. And my great-grandparents had settled in Ashton, Iowa, so that name really resonated with me. But yes, full circle moment here. Go ahead and name your gardens. I think it's a nice little habit. And of course, you know that I love to say that gardening is a relationship. So naming your garden just goes hand in hand with that. And then finally, Linda Richardson sent in pictures of her beautiful daylilies. And she prides herself on growing daylilies that are not just yellow, that are not just the Stellas. So she's got pink and coral. Very, very pretty. And she took these pictures in the morning. Great job. All right, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. Now, if you'd like to participate in today's Gardener Greetings segment, go ahead and send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to Jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's Jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And I've also had a request to see if it's okay to share your garden greetings in the Facebook group for the show. And of course, that is completely fine with me. Just go ahead and tag those posts, Gardener Greetings, and I'll be sure to share them on the show. And here's a little reminder that if you want to listen to the show while you're at home, just ask Alexa or Google to play the Daily Gardener podcast. Now, if they start to play one of the older episodes and you want to get caught up and listen to the most recent episode, just ask for the most recent episode of the Daily Gardener podcast and they'll play it for you. It's just that easy. Here's today's curated news. First up is an announcement from Magnolia Plantation and Gardens. This is hot off the press. This is the post that they shared on social media. And they write, At approximately 7 p.m. last night, a large tree fell in our garden. And it landed on our historic and iconic white bridge, 
taking out most of the railing and the posts on the left side ramp. There are now major structural cracks in the fascia boards on both sides, and the deck itself is warped and we suspect major damage to the framing members underneath. By mid-morning, the tree had been cut up and hauled away. Naturally, they're going to try to preserve as much as they can, and they anticipate that the replacements will need to be made in wood, that's nearly impossible to find, and it will require exceptional work to reproduce the profiles of the moldings and trims. This iconic white bridge at Magnolia Gardens dates back to the 1840s, and if you'd like to see it, just Google Magnolia Gardens White Bridge, and you'll be struck by how beautiful and just how long it is. Now, the bridge was originally installed by John Drayton as an element in his romantic garden that he created for his Philadelphia bride. And Magnolia Gardens writes, With this as its founding love story, it can only grow grander in this forced restoration. Well, we wish them all the luck in the world. In repairing the bridge, I'm sure they'll do a wonderful job. All right, now the first curated news article that I have for you today was from The Middle-Sized Garden, which is just a wonderful blog. And the website says that if your garden is bigger than a courtyard, but smaller than an acre, then that blog is is for you. It's called the Middle Sized Garden, and there's a hyphen in between middle and sized. Now, they wrote a post recently called What is Cottage Garden Style and How to Achieve It? Alexandra Campbell writes this blog, and she covers everything from garden fertilizer and growing vegetables to pruning and general garden maintenance. Now, the post that Alexandra recently wrote that caught my attention is called What is Cottage Garden Style and How to Achieve It? And I thought I'd read a quick little excerpt for you. And then if you'd like to track down her post and read it in detail, you can find it in the Facebook group for the show. And I love that Alexandra starts out by confronting something that all gardeners have been dealing with, and that is sourcing plants. It's been challenging. She writes, It has been difficult to source exactly the plants we want. We've had to compromise on color and style, and friends have been saying things like, I wouldn't normally buy scarlet pelargoniums, but they were the only ones I could find. So true. Alexandra writes, As for whether the cottage garden style really came from cottages, in theory it started when low-paid farm workers filled their gardens with vegetables, herbs, and fruit trees for their own use. There's a theory that cottage dwellers got the leftover plants when the head gardener divided them up. Now, as for whether there are rules to cottage gardening, Alexandra says, nope, there aren't any. That's the whole point. There's no need to plant in threes or fives or in drifts or to think about color combinations unless you want to. Alexandra encourages us to focus on easy plants and flowers. And you'll be off to the races. Now, if you'd like to read this post in depth for yourself, just search for the word cottage in the Facebook group for the show. And this post will pop up and you can read through it and find the inspiration you need to start your own cottage garden. Then next up was a post that was from Higgledy Garden. And it was all about sowing biennial flower seeds in June and July. This is a fantastic post about the biennial flower seeds that you should consider growing in your garden, especially if you're looking for more color and more blooms, enough to get you through the entire summer, and especially if you're looking for good cut flowers. 
on their post of recommended biennials. They like the plant Lunaria or Honesty, that's the common name. Honesty flowers make great cut flowers. They love Sweet Williams. They also recommend foxgloves, especially the white foxglove Alba, which they consider to be very essential for a home florist. And then finally, they also recommend Hesperus. And here's what they said about Hesperus. I love this flower. One of my favorites of all the flowers I've ever grown. Simple, pretty, easy to grow. So there you go, a little list of biennial flowers that you can plant in your garden. And if you'd like to read this post for yourself, just search for the word biennial in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop right up. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles and original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show, the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. On this day in 1926, the Green Bay Press Gazette posted an article titled Ice Cream Grown on Vine in the Yard of Former Kentuckian. The article was about the fabulous Colonel Henry Wallace Johnston, who, until the age of 50, had operated a hardware store in Lebanon, Kentucky. At midlife, he moved to Homestead, Florida, and in 1912, he created a 20-acre estate he called Palm Lodge Tropical Grove. Henry was a character. He enjoyed dressing the part of a tropical explorer, wearing a tropical outfit complete with a white helmet and looking as if he had just finished playing Jumanji. Henry became known as the Wizard of Palm Lodge or Florida's Burbank, a nod to California's Luther Burbank. And he added over 8,000 incredible specimens of tropical fruits and flowers. Many were not found anywhere else in America. Truly, Palm Lodge gained Henry a worldwide recognition. And although Henry never traveled outside the United States, he was a natural marketer, and Palm Lodge's reputation brought the plants to him. Henry's story includes the following spectacular facts. First, he grew almost all of his plants from seed. He coined the name lipstick tree. He grew a rare flower that produced a perfume called the scent of Lilith. He grew the dumb cane tree, or Diefenbachia, from Cambodia, and he would tell folks that if they bit into the leaves, their tongue would be paralyzed for six weeks. He successfully cultivated rubber plants. Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford had brought them back from Madagascar, but only Henry's plants had survived. He grew the Palestine tree, and he wrapped the fruit in cellophane while on the tree to protect it against insects. The fruit was used in religious rituals by rabbis, and Henry would send it to them. He grew the gingerbread palm, and the palm's fruit tasted of gingerbread. He furnished almost all of the plants for the state of Florida's tropical exhibit at the Chicago World's Fair. He produced nearly 300 different types of fruits and jellies, and he packaged all of them at Palm Lodge. And he was a master of the aloe vera plant, and he planted a 15-acre aloe vera field. 
By 1920, Henry was regularly harvesting the leaves and bringing them to Miami, and each one had to be individually wrapped to stop the spines from making the jelly ooze out. Henry loved to tell about a plant that he called the ice cream vine, botanically known as the Monstera deliciosa. The fruit resembles a large ear of corn, minus the husk, and tastes like a combination of banana, strawberry, and pineapple. Henry's Palm Lodge of Florida was a showplace, and there was no charge for admission. Homestead, Florida's Chamber of Commerce advertised that 30,000 people, including botanists, visited the lodge every year. And one day, after 2,000 or so guests had passed through the gardens, the register revealed that Henry Ford had visited unnoticed in the crowd. And it was on this day in 1941 that a Soviet court sentenced the extraordinary 20th century Russian botanist Nikolai Vavilov to death by firing squad. Worried about the world's plant biodiversity, Vavilov became a dedicated plant collector, and he had the foresight to build the world's first seed bank in St. Petersburg. His life's mission was something he called a mission for all humanity, and it was tied directly to his drive to build a seed bank. Vavilov wanted to end world hunger and famine, and he planned to accomplish this ambitious goal through science. He hoped to breed super plants that would be both nutritious and hardy so that they could be grown even in the most challenging locations on the planet. During his life, Vavilov had enjoyed Lenin's support. His big ideas knit perfectly together with Lenin's desire for a socialist utopia. But after Lenin died, Vavilov was on the outs. His family was made up of accomplished scientists, and they were considered part of the bourgeoisie and scorned. The events that led to Vavilov's sentencing and ultimate death had to do with Vavilov's critique of a fellow scientist. Vavilov had publicly criticized a geneticist named Lysenko, who had Stalin's backing. And so on this day in 1941, Vavilov was sentenced to die. But Vavilov never faced the firing squad. Instead, he died of starvation two years after receiving his sentence. Today, the Vavilov Institute houses over a quarter of a million specimens and is a living monument to Vavilov, the scientist who wanted food security for all of humanity, yet ironically died of starvation in the basement of a Soviet prison. And today in 1942, newspapers announced the retirement of the father of hybrid corn, George Schall. An Ohio farm kid, George was the noted botanist who taught at Princeton University for 27 years. George's work resulted in a $150 million increase in the value of U.S. corn, and it was a direct result of his crossing pure line varieties with self-fertilized corn. George's uber-productive hybrid yielded 10 to 40 percent more than ordinary corn. And like many plant breeders, George never made a penny from his creation. In Unearthed Words, today's poetry features a favorite summer plant, the tomato, Solanum lycopersicum.
This first quote's by the American chef and writer Mario Batali. You know, when you get your first asparagus or your first acorn squash or your first really good tomato of the season, those are the moments that define the cook's year. I get more excited by that than anything else. The American writer and humorist Lewis Grizzard said, It's difficult to think of anything but pleasant thoughts while eating a homegrown tomato. And the American singer and songwriter John Denver sang about tomatoes in his song called Homegrown Tomatoes. Homegrown Tomatoes, Homegrown Tomatoes. What would life be like without homegrown tomatoes? Only two things that money can't buy. That's true love and homegrown tomatoes. And then finally, the cartoon Hey Arnold by Craig Bartlett had an episode that featured tomatoes. This is the episode where Mr. Simmons reads the Walter Charles Walter poem, The poem is called They Were Delicious, which is a parody of the William Carlos Williams poem called This Is Just to Say. Here's the dialogue from the episode. Mr. Simmons begins reciting the poem while Harold steals Mr. Simmons' lunch and starts eating it. Here's They Were Delicious by Mr. Simmons from Hey Arnold. I have eaten the tomatoes that were on the window sill. Were you saving them for a special occasion? I apologize. They were delicious. So juicy. So red. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Backyard Parables by Margaret Roach. This book came out in 2013, and the subtitle is Lessons on Gardening and Life. And one of my favorite cookbook authors, Anna Thomas, said, As I read this witty, revealing, sometimes poetic confessional, I felt I understood for the first time what a garden could be, a work of art, a source of pleasure and solace, an object of beauty, provider of nourishment, and why Margaret calls the plot she tends my monster. This is the story of a real relationship, Margaret and her garden, a love story. This book is 288 pages of Margaret's stories about gardening, culled from 30 seasons of growing and learning what works and what does not. You can get a copy of The Backyard Parables by Margaret Roach and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. That's right, $3. I think everyone, every gardener, should have a copy of this book in their library. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. On this day in 1963, the Marvel comic botanist Samuel Smithers became Plant Man when lightning struck his plant ray gun, giving it the power to control and animate all plant life. After losing his duel with the human torch in the botanical garden, Plant Man was taken to prison. In his last storyline, Plant Man transformed into a giant plant monster and attacked the city of Los Angeles in retaliation for humans polluting the world. In his final moments, Plant Man was defeated by Iron Man. Here's one of Plant Man's more popular lines. Do not speak to the Plant Man of power. Mine was the genius 
that gave semblance of life to unthinking plant tissue. There can be no greater power than that. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.